Okay, good evening and welcome to the public information session for our Northeast Area Elementary Boundary Study. I'm Chris Percato from the Office of Strategic Planning. And to cover a few house rules here this evening, um, committee members, please make sure you uh, signed in on our sign-in sheet as you came in the door. Um, in the event of an emergency, we do have our emergency exits here where you entered the cafeteria. Uh, if the fire alarm or anything should sound, we'll evacuate to the parking lot and we'll review those sign-in sheets to make sure that we've accounted for everyone. So please make sure you're signed in. Uh, restrooms are located out the glass doors to the left and around the corner. Please don't proceed into any other areas of the building. Um, and our BCPS TV crew is here with us this evening. Um, we do have mics and cameras available. If anyone is speaking tonight, please raise your hand to be recognized and you'll be directed. We have a mic up front here on the right and one on the left here because we do want to make sure that all our folks joining us virtually at home can hear all our conversations. Um, we do have some COVID mitigation protocols in effect. We're in limited attendance here this evening, and so only our committee members and staff members are attending live. Everyone else is attending virtually. Um, and that link is on our main BCPS webpage at www.bcps.org under the events section. There's a link there that will take you to the boundary study page and you can find the link to the meeting there. Um, our uh, shared resources are limited so there, uh, there should, shouldn't be any necessity to share resources. Uh, there should be sufficient resources around the table. Um, water bottles are available up front for your personal consumption. Uh, we are masked at all times while we're in the building. If anyone should need to step outside for a mask break, please you're welcome to do so. Um, we'll attempt to maintain physical distancing of approximately six feet. Um, hand sanitizers are available at the table. And should anyone find themselves in receipt of a positive COVID test um, during the duration of these meeting cycles, please report that to Mike Godfredson in our Office of Strategic Planning and he will coordinate with the health department. We have a few words from our Spanish interpreter this evening, and then we'll turn it over to our consultant, Matt Cropper. Buenas noches. Le queremos dar la bienvenida a todas nuestras familias latinas. Gracias por participar de esta reunión. Si tienen alguna pregunta, por favor, tómense la libertad de hacerla. Que queremos nuestro mejor esfuerzo para contestarlas en español. Gracias de vuelta por participar de esta reunión. Okay, well, thank you all for, uh, for coming tonight, and thank you, members of the public, who are observing uh, this meeting virtually. Um, uh, we are here tonight to present some options to the public for your review and consideration and feedback. Uh, it's a lot of hard work that's gone in up to this date, and uh, we're at a point where the committee is ready to share some, some options with the public. Um, as Mr. Bracado said with Baltimore County Public Schools, is that this process is, is taking account some mitigation strategies for COVID. Uh, this meeting, this public information session is virtual for observers, uh, the, the, the general public to watch, and it will be recorded. We do have committee members uh, present, and the committee members have been present at all committee meetings, but we have not allowed uh, uh, observers to come uh, due to the mitigation strategies that we are uh, employing. Um, but committee members will be here, and if there are any questions that are asked, a uh, committee member feels uh, appropriate to answer, they are invited to come up and help answer questions in addition to the consultants and staff. Um, so tonight, the purpose of tonight is for you to really learn how this process has been working. Uh, we want to go over the, 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 the process and the timeline. We want you to review some draft boundary options for the elementary schools in the study area. So we have maps, two options to share with you tonight. And the most importantly, we want the public to complete an online survey related to the options to provide valuable input to the committee. So there's a survey that's, that's kicked off starting tonight. It's on the BCPS webpage. If you scroll down and find the Northeast Area Boundary Study and you go to the public information session block, you'll see there is a, a link to, to take the survey. What we ask is that since this is being live streamed, as we're given our presentation, if you have any questions, uh, even during the course of the presentation, 
You can post those into the Microsoft Teams uh, app and, and, and type any questions you may have. Um, and then those questions will be answered and fielded at the end of the presentation. So you can, you can feel free to at, post those questions at any time and we will address those questions at the end. If we can't, if we run out of time and we cannot answer all questions, we will follow up with uh, an answer to, to, to questions that are pertinent to this study. So let's talk about the boundary change study. It's guided by policy in Rule 1280. Uh, it's facilitated by an independent consultant, uh, driven by a community-based committee. This committee is made up of principals, teachers, and parents that, uh, are, that, that work and live in the area that we are talking about boundary changes. Um, this involves an objective examination of data, looking at developing options in an open and transparent manner, really empowering the members of the committee and, and stakeholders, people who live in this area with the ability to evaluate all the data and information and make changes to maps and, and ultimately develop a map that they want to recommend to the school board for their consideration. So, um, so the, the, this, this process is open and it has been from the start and uh, we welcome the public at this, at this important evening to, uh, to look and see the progress of this group. I am uh, Matthew Cropper with Cropper GIS Consulting. We're, uh, we have um, offices all over the country, but uh, we specialize in this type of work, um, uh, boundary study work, demographic study work, and a lot of other things like that related to K-12 schools. We've been working with BCPS for quite some time, for, for several years on multiple studies, and we're honored to be here to help us facilitate this process for this group and uh, for this particular region. Let's talk a little bit about the Boundary Study Committee. The Boundary Study Committee represents each school community. There are 33 members uh, on this committee and 25 of those are voting members on this committee. We have eight principals and the principals are here as mo more of an advisory role. They are non-voting members but they provide very valuable input and uh, in considerations as things are as boundaries are being discussed and talking about the schools. We have eight teacher and staff representatives, 16 parents. So there are two par there are two parents from every school uh, sitting around the table working with us as we work through these options. And we also have one area educational advisory council representative. So a representative that 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 serves the, the region. We asked this committee to, su to suspend their parochial interest. So we always tell committee members, take off your parent hat or your teacher hat when you, get, when, you, when you come into this room and put on your committee member hat and focus on developing a plan or a recommendation that best meets the needs of all children in this area. And don't focus only on what's best for your child or your school, but think holistically and think about what's best for all children as you work to a recommendation that, that is best for everybody in this region. Um, this group uh, has been collabor collaboratively uh, working together in, 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 in small groups over the past couple of, of uh, months in, 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 in evaluating options and building things to, to, in preparation for this evening. Ultimately, uh, the recommendation will be, we will, will be presented to the Board of Education via the community superintendent. So when this is all done and the committee votes and finalizes a recommendation, typically myself and the community superintendent will present your recommendation uh, to the Board of Education for their consideration and approval. So here's our process. You can see the green blocks are areas where we have had meetings and then we are here in the public information session phase. So we've had four meetings so far working with this group and evaluating all the data and information and maps and looking at um, statistics and all the information that's pertinent to our study. And we are here at the public information session ready to share some maps with you. Our focus up to this point has been bringing some maps that, that they feel are viable and best adhere to our uh, objectives and rules. And, um, and this is where we are. We have two more meetings after this the, as, with the committee to finalize a recommendation. Uh, we are expected to, to recommend the, uh, your plan to the board on February the 8th, 2022. 
and that once the board uh, hears the recommendation, there is an additional time period where uh, there will be a board hearing on February 16th at Eastern Technical High School, and that's where me any member of the public can come out and, uh, and voice their opinions about the recommendation to the board. And this, this enables the board to hear any, input, any additional input from community members before they vote. And that vote is expected to occur on March 8th of next year, 2022. And so we've got some time still, but the committee has made a lot of good progress and we're uh, anxious to share some maps with you this evening. So let's talk a little about the study area, the area that we're looking at evaluating boundary changes for. So the, dis the district is in the midst of a $1.3 billion Schools for Our Future capital plan. It's adding capacity to support increasing enrollment and to improve facilities all across the school, the school district, all across the county. Um, this plan includes four elementary school projects in the Northeast region. Um, in spring 2021, the superintendent initiated a boundary change for eight schools in the Northeast Area Elementary School community. So we were looking at a subset of the county here, at this Northeast Area, and evaluating the, these, uh, the boundaries for these, this, a subset of schools within the district in the Northeast Area. So this is why we need to take a look at boundaries in the area. There's a construction of a new elementary school in this region, in the Northeast Area. Um, that is expected to open in, in 22-23. And that is expected to accommodate 709 students. And so that is certainly uh, being planned to help address overcrowding of many schools in this area and certainly will help that. In addition to the new school that's being constructed, Red House Run is, is being reconstructed and expanded to house uh, from 460 to 775. And that's anticipated to open in the next year, 2023-24. Um, so seven of the eight schools participating in the study were over capacity as of September 30th, 2019. So there is definitely a, a definitive need to add capacity. You could see four uh, of the schools exceeded 115% of their capacity. Um, and, uh, and so there was certainly is an evident need to bring more space in this area to accommodate the families and the, 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 the communities that live in this area. This is just a map that shows you our general study area. So this is the area, anything that's highlighted on the map are areas that, are, that could be impacted. Uh, we try to say that we would try to minimize the impact and move as few students as possible when we're doing this job. But it's, uh, it should be understood that any student could be impacted as part of this process within this study area. You see the participating schools are over here on the left, uh, and that includes the new Northeast Area Elementary and Red House Run, which is currently there, but it's being expanded, it doubled, almost doubled in size to uh, help provide some capacity relief. So, so it's, it's, a rather, it's a rather large area, and, there, and, and we've been evaluating all of these, uh, these boundaries as part of this process. You can see the new Northeast Area Elementary School sits right here, uh, right on the line between Fullerton and Elmwood's boundary, and that's the, the location of the new Northeast Area Elementary, and Red House Run is down here, and this is the school that's being expanded, like I mentioned. So beyond this area, a new Honeygo Elementary uh, and reconstruction and expansion of Victory Villa welcomed students in fall of 2018. So this region has had a lot of change over the last several years. And we have been in this area working on boundary changes over the last several years. Um, two boundary study processes were conducted in 2017 in coordination with these projects. And you can see these are the schools that were, that were included in prior boundary studies in this area. Um, the schools that are highlighted in orange are the schools that were involved, that were there around the table last time when we were talking about moving boundaries. But it's most important to know that as we do this work, from, from year to year, we're focusing on if a, if a community gets impacted, if at all possible, don't impact the same community again. So if we've moved somebody already in prior years, try not to move them again, just to further reduce the impact on communities that, ha that may have been moved in a recent boundary study. And we have done that so far. There are no, no areas that were moved in a prior boundary study 
that ha, uh, in, uh, that's mentioned here in the, in the recent history that have been impacted in this study. So our objectives are to have a community-based process that's open and transparent, enabling people to watch and view and participate and observe. And our goals and objectives are to reduce overcrowding in this region, um, to create viable and successful boundaries, to utilize the added capacity with the new, new Northeast Area School and Red House Run Elementary, and then support diversity among schools that reflect the community and the school system. So, so just really trying to help uh, balance the utilization here and address the overcrowding and fully utilize these schools and doing it, doing it in an equitable manner. This is rule 1280. These are some of the things that, that, that we use as guidelines or rules to follow if the committee considers moving a boundary line one way or the other they always ask themselves, are we, are we better adhering to these rules? And so the best plan will be one that touches on these rules as best as possible, adheres to these as best as possible, knowing that no plan can al it was always going to be perfect. There will be parts of the plan that you wish you could make better, but there's things that you can't control, such as the number of uh, people in the different communities, where the schools are located, the size of the schools, and where, how the communities and residential communities build out. There's different things, things that we can't control, but we will try to address uh, and adhere to these rules as best as possible. And they are to make efficient use of capacity in affected schools. Maintain or increase the diversity among schools to reflect the diversity of the region and the school system. Other considerations per Rule 1280 are to maintain the continuity of neighborhoods. So try not to draw the line down the middle of a residential street if at all possible. Thinking of communities as, uh, as uh, kids playing together after school and during the summers, you want to try to keep that social dynamic and that community dynamic intact. And if they have to move, they move together. But try not to draw the line down the middle of a residential street, if at all possible, to try to maintain that continuity of a neighborhood. Be mindful of the impact of transportation and pedestrian patterns on students, so looking at uh, routes to schools and viable ways that, that kids may be transported to schools or walk to school. Walkability is a, is a component and, it's, and it certainly is in play here in this process. And we also have staff from BCPS from transportation helping to inform us and give us input as transportation questions arise. Minimize the number of times any individual students are reassigned. So that's just being, being mindful of what has moved previously what may be moving now, and just try not to move the same area again to just further reduce that impact. Long-term enrollment, capacity trends, and future capital plans. So not only looking at what we have now, but looking at projected information, where the future residential housing is going in, trying to be as proactive as possible and, uh, a a as we work towards a recommendation. Location of feeder school boundaries and continuity of feeder patterns. So this really is looking at the progression of an elementary area to middle school and a middle school to high school. So this group is only focused on elementaries. They're not, they're, the, the recommendation that comes from this committee will not have any impact on where a student is assigned for middle school or high school. They will stay where they are zoned based off of uh, where they currently are. But this could have an impact on the percentage of a school that goes to the middle school level. And when and, and you're looking at that percentage, you want to make sure, in an ideal world, you'd have 100% of an elementary school go to the same middle. If you have to split a school, it's best to have it be about a 50-50 split. Or if it has to split to three schools, make sure it's as balanced as possible. You want to try to avoid a very small split of a student's and community uh, school area going to one middle school and, uh, and the majority of the school go to another middle school. So trying to keep the community continuity of feeder patterns in mind. Additional considerations to, for things that the committee has been focusing on is using geographic features such as railroads, creeks, and major highways. So trying to draw the lines down major roads. Again, that aligns with uh, efficient transportation and, as, as, um, as it's, and also ensures the safety and security of students as much as possible and minimizes 
the, the possibility of students go, uh, crossing over major roads and things like that. And then elimination of existing satellite boundaries. So this definitely is in play here in this area. A satellite boundary is an area that you have one region that is zoned to a school, and a satellite boundary may be an area that's separate from the main boundary, that may be, uh, that may be disconnected from the main boundary. So this exists right now in our study area. You could see here Elmwood and McCormick. Uh, this bottom area, southwest corner of our study area is purple. This actually feeds into Elmwood School. And then there also is some satellite areas here where some of this is Elmwood and other part is McCormick. That's some, this is something that this committee has looked at resolving in undoing some of these satellite areas. And both options do resolve this and, and get rid of these satellite areas. And these, these um, they are not favorable in most cases for transportation. And it's best, best practice to have one boundary per school, if at all possible. So the work done to date, this committee has met four times since September. Um, they have reviewed six variations of maps since the process started. So we, we came with a couple of maps to the start. They did some group work, marked up maps, gave us input, and we brought back some modified maps. And we've, did that, we've done that back and forth a couple times in bringing new maps and evolutions of maps based off of input that the committee has provided through the course of this study. Um, there is a lot of information and data that any member of the public can access online, that statistics and data that are uh, pertinent to our rules and considerations, information about enrollment, capacity, demographics, feeder patterns, students impacted, a lot of good information for them to evaluate the current zones and then also any particular option that's being drafted. These options, are, we always say that they are considered draft through the course of the, the entire course of this process. Um, even, if the, even when the committee uh, recommends a map to go to the board, it's still considered draft. The board has the full ability to make changes to your recommendation as a committee if they feel they see fit. So nothing is final until the board approves a plan. So it should be considered draft all the way through the course of this. And you know that that just that gives you flexibility to give us feedback and lets the lets the committee hear input from the public, as well as continue to evaluate maps all the way to the end, to, to try to make these map or this recommendation as best as they possible, adhering to our rules and considerations. Uh, the committee is charged to recommend one option to the board of education, so it will be one map that will be presented to the board for consideration or for approval. And like I said, nothing will be final until the board approves a plan. So still draft even as we are, uh, as we are here tonight. So when you look at the maps, you'll see a lot of maps, a series of, of information and maps. The background color represents the actual zone for every, any particular school. You'll see um, also on a lot of maps what we call planning blocks. They're little black and white dashed outlines. And these represent building blocks for boundary changes. So we look at these planning blocks are areas that the committee is evaluating to move one way or the other. And what we do is with each of these planning blocks, we provide information to the committee and to the public regarding how many kids live in, uh, in each planning block that goes to their zoned school. And so then they could see, okay, this planning block may have 65 kids. This one only has 10, so we can't move move them both and have an even swap. And so they're evaluating the densities of students in, inside each planning block. And, and it helps enable committee and public to fully understand how many kids live in smaller areas, subsets of this study area, and what would be the impact of moving a, a planning block one way or the other. You'll notice that some of the maps also have planning block IDs on them. So we, we tell the public um, and the committee, if you're, if you're interested in a sp specific area, you can note the planning block number, and then we can all hone in on the specific area you're talking about. But when you look at options maps, you'll see that the background color represents the option, and then there will be a bold black outline overlaid on top of the map of the color of the colored map 
that shows you where the current zone lines are. So you can kind of see how the current line looks and then how the option spills outside of the, uh, or inside of the bold black outline. And that kind of gives you an idea on areas that have been changed per the, per the draft option. We do have statistics that are pertinent to the, to the study area. They're made uh, to accompany the map. So we, we have them in a large plot format and those are available online. And you also have a handout, an eight and a half by 11 document that's available online that members of the public can print out and they can see all the statistics and data. And I'm gonna give you a little bit of overview on the statistics uh, it's just so that you know what, uh, what they are and kind of what they, what they represent. And these are all the data and information that the committee has been using to evaluate the, the, the options in addition to the actual maps. So here at the start, you can see there's information about the schools, what their capacity is. You can see uh, how many kids are enrolled currently. We have information on what their utilization is. And this is what I really look at uh, mostly is uh, in this table is what, 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 how full are they? And then you can see there's some deltas that show how many seats over or under capacity, over or under 100% that each school is. And then we also have information about other data such as pre-K and other, other information that, that rolls up to a total uh, uh, enrollment for every particular building. We are working off the September 30th, 2019 enrollment as part of the study. 2020 was a strange year with, with COVID. It did have impacts on enrollment. And uh, 2019 is a more stable year to use for planning for the purposes of this study. And so 2019 is what we are working off as we evaluate options and work towards a recommendation. So you can see here now, we start showing options. So we have information about the current enrollment of a school, and then we look at what the estimated enrollment is for any, any, each option for any particular school. So this is, this, you use this table if you wanna know how many students are at a particular school currently, and then how many do they have in option one or two. This will tell you how many students are estimated in that, in that building. We also have information, the same data, but it's looking at it a different way. It's comparing enrollment, estimated enrollment, to the capacity of the schools. So this is what we call utilization. So uh, what's the utilization of the current schools? And then what is the utilization for each option? And you could see this table demonstrates uh, the relief that's being provided across the study area. And that currently, the district the study area average is 114% utilized and your schools over 100 are, 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 all, are across the board here. And in, and in our options that we're sharing, we're working with 93% capacity for a study area by adding those new, the new school and the expanded red house. And you can see the balance of utilization that exists in both of these options that the committee is bringing forward to you to dra for in draft tonight. So they certainly have provided relief in balancing that utilization across this area as they work through this. We also have information on demographics of students. What are the current demographics uh, as it relates to percent minority, the percent free and reduced lunch, and the percent English language learners. So this is something evaluating what the current uh, statistics are and what does the option, how does the option relate as we work through uh, evaluating the demographics, it's good to try to see if there's any way to bring schools into, into better uh, balance of the, of the average. We look at these averages to see if, how close are we. And usually there's some things that we can and cannot do. We can only go so far in many cases, but it's usually best to try to, to if you can, uh, improve that balance of demographics across these, these various variables if at all possible, but try not to get further away from, uh, from, from that proximity to the district average. So that's something that, that the committee has been evaluating in addition to the other criteria and, uh, and, and statistics. We are monitoring how many students are impacted in any particular option. You can see that option one impacts 969 and option two currently impacts 911 students. And, um, and then if you wanna know how many students from, are going from one building to another, these detailed tables will tell you that. And, 
Everything in green shows students who have not moved, and anything in these, in these lighter colored areas represent numbers of students who are moving from one school to one school. So, for example, in option two, um, Elmwood is sending 72 students to McCormick Elementary School. And you can see in these, these totals right here, all these tan colored or lighter colored cells, roll up to the total that shows over here for the total impacted. These are feeder pattern tables. This is what the committee's been looking at to see the impact on feeder patterns. Uh, you see a 100%, that means an elementary school feeds 100% into a middle school. And when you see a school listed more than once, like Elmwood in option two, you can see it's split between two schools. 78% goes to Parkville, 22% goes to Golden Ring. And so um, that's just to monitor the, the impact on feeder patterns. Again, middle and high schools are not, not affected in this study. It's just the elementary zones that are being evaluated, but it does have an impact on that percentage. So that's something that the, making the committee aware of the impacts on that. Walk zones, we did have uh, currently all, both options maintain all walkers within uh, the current walk zones within the, every school in the study area. We had prior maps that did have some students moving out of the walk zones and adjustments have been made to ensure that walkability is maintained at, uh, in all options for all schools. And so that, that is a constant for both options in this particular map. Any student who can walk right now is still in a walkable environment. So we've got uh, two options to, to give you a preview on uh, and we will be available to answer questions after this, after I give a little uh, detailed view. Um, we, like I said, please post your questions in Microsoft Teams chat at any time and we will field those here in a, in a, in a few minutes. And any questions that are pertinent to the study will be ones that we will be address, addressing and, and answering tonight. These maps are also available. We have an interactive map that's uh, croppermap.com slash bcpsne2021. That lets you see the options. You can, you can zoom in and zoom out and turn on and off different options. And, um, and, and, and as you go in closer on the map, you can see more detail. It can be a very useful tool. And then all the materials that the committee has been evaluating over the time uh, is available as well to the uh, members of the public under highlights at bcps.org. So you can go back and look at any materials, even from the first meeting, meeting up till tonight, that have been shared and evaluated by the committee. So a little bit of a, just a breakdown on the options, want to look at them. These are the current zones, the elementary zones in the study area. And then we have option one that you could see the bold outline uh, shows you the current zones and the background color is the option. And then option two has, the, they, they're looking similar, but there are differences in specific areas. So we have some zooms, zooms here to kind of give the public a little preview on how they differ. And so if you look at this, this is the southwestern area of the, of the study area. You can see currently we have those satellite areas that we talked about. And then in both options, this bottom part that was Elmwood is feeding into Red House Run in both maps. And then this area in here that was between Elmwood and McCormick all feeds into McCormick now. Um, the only difference between option one and option two in this region is there's an area here uh, on the, that is currently Shady Spring that's fed into Red House Run in option one. And then over here, this is option, uh, this is in Elmwood in option two. And this is around Golden Ring Road, and this is 95 right here. So this is the area that differs between the two options currently um, in this particular region. Looking at the central section, you can see that Fullerton uh, really comes around and pulls uh, all of this area currently where the new Northeast Area Elementary School is. In the options, the new Northeast Area Elementary School is this tan area, and you can see this area is now being drafted to the new, nor new Northeast Area Elementary School. They, the, the same general large area does uh, feed into the school in both maps, except there is a, chain, a little bit here that you see that feeds into Elmwood. And over on this map, it feeds into 
the new Northeast Area Elementary School. So that's a difference that you'll note. And then you'll also see an area here as Vincent Farm is some of Vincent Farms on the east of 95 is feeding the new, new school. And over here, it's a, it's a smaller area feeding into the new school from Vincent Farm. Um, other, than, other than that area that I mentioned for Vincent Farm, this, this, this shows you the, the other larger section of Vincent Farm is the same in both options, and it's, it, is re, it is really unaffected other than the area that I talked about down near 95. So Vincent Farm and the rest of the, the zone, other than the area south, uh, just east of 95, um, is the only area that is in play right now for Vincent Farm. So at that, at now what we'd like to do is just open the floor for any questions that may have been posted online. Um, and you can please post those questions at any time in chat, and we're going to take a look and see if we can answer any of them. We're not going to be able to answer specific questions about a child or anything that does not apply to the boundary study process, but really focused only on things that are pertinent to the study process. And we will follow up if we can't answer all your questions tonight. Um, and we will be here available in, in this uh, committee will also be able to help uh, answer these questions if they uh, if they would like so are there any questions that have been posted online all right so our first question is will the new school be accepting fifth graders next year Okay, so oh, oh, you were gonna answer. Hello, um, yes, the new school will be welcoming every grade from pre-K through fifth grade. Um, we do not have a school name yet. It's a policy um, 7250 that comes out and it'll be posted on BCPS's website that'll be welcoming all suggestions for the new school um, and that should be coming up in the next couple of weeks. Another question, Matt. Um, can students who are already in schools choose to stay at their schools? So um, the, the, the district does have a policy in place called terminal grade policy, and that allows students to further reduce the impact if, if a student is in their final two years of school, fourth or fifth grade when the school opens, they do have the option to stay at their current school. Um, and also siblings are eligible to stay at the current school. The caveat to that is that, the, is that the student must have transportation provided to the school and that transportation will not be provided to those, school, to those, those students. But they do have the option to continue out their final year or two at the school that they're at right now uh, if they are coming into the fourth or fifth grade in that, that year that the school opens. Also, when will the boundaries change? When okay, will, like, so the students be attending the, the, these new schools based on these changes. <laughs> so the boundaries will change when the school is open and available to accept students. And so there are this is a phased process, and that the schools are not o opening at the same time, at the same year. But what we will do is, and the, what the district will do will in, is to only move students once. So. They, were going to, they are going to make every effort to move as many students as possible when space is made available, but ensure that a student, if they, if they do move, that they don't move uh, the following year when the, the next phase is implemented. So it'll be done strategically so that if a student moves, they will only move one time, if, if at all possible. One person asked, maybe just to reiterate on this, Matt, they asked about um, if the students for the new schools have already been selected. So just maybe explain what the process okay. is. Okay. 
Uh, so the question is, have the, new, the students for the new school been selected? So that we are, we're getting close, but we're still working through the, uh, determining that, the committee is. Any area, when you look at the maps, if you look at option one and option two on any particular map, the area that is zoned, that, that the tan area is for the new Northeast Area Elementary School, those are the areas that are currently drafted or under consideration to go to the new school. So, but keep in mind, everything is still draft and is subject to change, but as it currently sits, any area that you see on the map that is in the tan color uh, within that new elementary, new, new Northeast Area Elementary School zone is the area that is being considered to be attending the new school. Um, I have a question. I thought I heard somewhere that the new school would be car riders and bus only, no walkers. Is that true? Um, I believe that the Office of Transportation is still evaluating walk zones for the new school. Um, it ha I, it, I would say that it has not been determined yet uh, of the walk area for the new school. Um, but the transportation, as they evaluate that, and when they have that information available, um, they, will, they will be presenting walkable areas uh, for the school if, if any walkable area does exist for that, that new elementary school. Okay. Uh, one more. Is the new Northeast school construction on schedule for opening fall of 2022? So yes, the, the new Northeast Area Elementary School is planned to open in fall of 22, and so that is on schedule. Is there any, anything else that needs to be added to that? There was a meeting this morning um, that we had with the construction with the construction workers and architects. We are at 33% of the um, building being built, and we are on schedule. Great. Question for special ed: um, How do these changes impact students receiving services at regional special education programs? So students currently receiving uh, services, special ed services in a regional program uh, currently located at Red House Run would still be anticipated to remain at Red House Run when the new building opens at this time. Question here, will this new school be eliminating a previous school? The, the new school is an additional school that's being constructed to help address the overcrowding in the area. So it is not, it is not uh, closing another school. This school is being built in addition to the schools that are there. And on top of that, Red House Run is being expanded uh, from 400 and something students to 700, over 700 students to further accommodate the, the needs of the region. We've had a couple questions about staffing at the new school, hiring teachers, et cetera, um, that it, you know, concerns about the ability to, to staff it with shortages already. So good evening, everybody. So the staffing process has already um, kicked off with information sessions. So Mr. Kevin Jennings, who you heard and saw speak a little bit earlier, um, has held two information sessions for teachers, um, interested teachers within Baltimore County Public Schools, and certainly um, for those teachers or new teachers who apply, that'll be handled through our normal human resource process in anticipation for spring of 2022.
Um, do you have a question about developments and how they're considered in the process? Um, how that's been, I guess, included in your consideration for this? I don't know if any of the committee want to talk about that. Have you guys have talked about that at all? Anybody want to take that one? Any committee members want to step up to the mic and help answer what we've done with developments? Um, I'll, I can answer that, no problem. Uh, so we have, been, we have been monitoring developments and residential development activity, and we have provided maps to the committee that highlight the location of future uh, and ongoing residential developments. So the committee is aware of locations of where the, where the residential developments are, are going in, and they're doing their best to be as proactive as possible. Uh, knowing that there's not a whole lot of space to work with and be as, and is, be as proactive as they may want, but uh, they're aware of where the developments are and, uh, and mindful of them as they work towards developing options. So I, is that fair? Maybe another one. Are there, are there any other capital projects planned for this area in the near future? You mentioned there's several that's been done recently. Are there any, any others that we should be looking forward to? Okay, so the question is, are there any other, any other plans for capital improvements in this area? And, um, I know that the, the district, the county, is currently doing uh, underway in a long-range facilities master plan, and they are identifying uh, improvements for, for schools across the county, including this area, um, that may not necessarily attribute to capacity increases. It may just be renovations or upgrades that exist and that exist not adding more school capacity. Uh, we're not aware of anything immediate that is, that is part of our work, but, uh, but there is a master plan underway that's addressing the needs of all schools in this area and the county. Okay, so I think that's, I think that's all of the questions that we have received uh, so far. Um, so, if you have further questions and comments, if there's something that we, we end this, this live stream tonight and you're like, oh, I wish I would have asked that question. I just thought about it. You can still provide input um, at bcps.org. Under the highlights section, you'll see the Northeast El Elementary Boundary comment form. At any time during this process, you can fill out a comment. But we also have a survey that's dedicated to this process, too, that we would like you to participate and fill out. And that survey is located under the public information session section of this, web, of this website. You can also email the board or the committee at boundarystudy at bcps.org if you'd like to do that. Um, and the, 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 the public can email comments to the Boundary Study Committee that way. Just keep in mind, anything you put on email is logged verbatim, and so that information is shared. And so anything that you post to us will be shared publicly with any member of the public. Uh, you can also observe any of these meetings live streamed. They're live streamed by Baltimore County Public Schools. So um, any committee meeting we have is made available to the public. And you can also go back and view prior meetings if you'd like to. And then, like I said, most importantly, the survey. It's from November 3rd to the November 17th is when the survey window is open. And that's available in English, Spanish, and Nepali. And anybody. Uh, can participate in that. We encourage you to fill out the survey and let us know what you think. It works on any particular uh, device. And finally, you can attend the Board of Education public hearing on February 16th um, to provide your input and, and to speak directly to members of the board if you, if you choose to do so. So our, looking forward, the next steps for us is we have a committee meeting on December 1st. Uh, from 6 to 8 p.m., and that will be available uh, uh, for the public to, to watch online. Um, like we said, the public is not able to participate in person at these committee meetings uh, due to the mitigation strategies for COVID, but you are always invited to watch these, and you can watch the recording or you can watch it live stream, and we welcome and invite you to do that. Um, so 
that's all we have tonight. Uh, and we really appreciate your participation and look forward to hearing from you in your comments and, your, and filling out the survey. And thank you all. And we hope you all have a very good night.